Right. I show one o'clock Central Standard Time. I am Dr. Christy Mulkey and I'm the workshop coordinator for 240 Tutoring. And I am live here in our Praxis Study and Test Prep group on Facebook to help you prepare for your exam. So the last few weeks, we've been doing videos on math and science. So we're going to finish up our science series today. So let's get started and jump right on into those questions and those competencies. Okay, I'm going to share my screen with you. So give me just a moment to make sure that's working. Hi, those of you live with us, welcome. Okay, yay, everything appears to be working today. Okay, so we are looking at the elementary ed science subtest, so 5005, 5005, and today we're going to be looking at topic three. We did topic uh, two last week and topic one the week before, and so in three videos we will have covered all the science standards that you will be tested on. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at what those standards say and then do some practice questions together. Now again, remember this video is specific to the Praxis Science Subtest. Um, it's going to cover your standards and it's going to look at actual released questions for your test. And I'm going to teach you some skills and some strategies to try to help you be as prepared as possible. If you've missed the other two science videos and you're preparing for that test, I would highly suggest you go check those out. We also have all the math videos. We've gone through all the math topics and all those practice questions. So you can check those out in our Facebook group or on YouTube. We have those in a playlist as well. So let's take a look at what that topic actually tells us. So here are the standards that you're held accountable for. So topic three is on physical science. Now the first two topics were life science and earth science, but now we're looking at physical science. This topic, if you are looking at the Praxis um, pre preparation manual and all the release questions that are in there, there are actually more practice questions on this topic than the other two science topics. So that's really helpful as you try to prepare for this exam. So this first part of this topic is looking at physical and chemical properties and the structure of matter. So the physical and chemical properties and structure of matter, and that's gonna include changes in states, mixtures, solutions, atoms, elements, all of those things. Part B is looking at force and motion. So knowing types of motion, the laws of motion, forces and equilibrium. Part three is looking at energy. So all things related to forms of energy, the transfer of energy, conservation of energy, and simple machines. So looking at work and the energy applied there. And then D, we're looking at interactions of energy and matter. So electricity, magnetism, sound, um, all of those things fall in there. Light would also fall in there. And then these last four are the same as they've been on the other two topics. So these repeat on each of the science topics. So looking at understanding interactions of, no, I'm sorry, understand science as a human endeavor, a process and a career, understand science as inquiry. So that scientific method going through that process, how do you science uh, resources and research and then understands the unifying processes of science. So understanding how systems and organization in science work. Those appear in all three topics. So the practice questions we're gonna look at today are really just looking at A through D. So those actual specific things to physical science. So let's do some practice questions. Now all these practice questions come from the free public published questions in the Praxis Study Companion, and that's on the ETS website. So if you want to go find all of these, you can right there on that website that's linked. So this first one is looking at forces and motions. So it says, if a feather and two rocks of different weights were dropped simultaneously from a height of five meters in a vacuum, which of the following would be true? A, both rocks would hit the ground at the same time, but before the feather. 
B, the heavier rock would hit the ground first. C, the lighter rock would hit the ground first. D, the feather and the two rocks would all hit the ground at the same time. Now, this is the first time I've done this, but I actually put, I included in here, the explanation that's provided in the study companion. And the reason I haven't done this in the past is sometimes they can be pretty technical and pretty wordy, and I'm trying to explain this in a more simplistic matter. But we're going to come back to this in just a second. I'm going to tell you the value of this one in particular. So I'm just going to talk you through this and try to help you understand what this question is asking you. But really, we're looking at Newton's laws and motion, acceleration, and gravitational pull, all of those things. So your gut, when you read this question, you want to say the heavier rock will fall faster and thus will hit the ground first. Because if you've ever all dropped things from a height, you know that the heavier thing, especially a rock and a feather, the feather's gonna kind of float around for a few seconds and that rock's gonna just go straight down. So your gut wants to answer that if you're not reading carefully. But there is a key word in this question that I wanna point out. It says five meters in a vacuum all right in a vacuum so if we're in a vacuum that gravitational pull in mass are really no longer factors and i'm gonna put this in really simple terms but once we have those words in a vacuum the mass of the objects is really no longer a factor and so that's what makes d the correct answer the feather and the two rocks would all hit the ground at the same time all right, so if you remember that, you probably reason your way through this question, but I wanna point out what this explanation shows you. It says the correct answer is, and I blocked that out just so you wouldn't jump right to it. In a vacuum, the only external force acting on each of the objects would be the gravitational force of the Earth. Right, so you still have that gravitational force, but the mass of the objects isn't a factor anymore, all right? The gravitational force is equal to mass times gravitational force, where M is the object's mass, and G is the constant acceleration of gravity. Okay, so that G is constant acceleration of gravity, and the M is the object's mass. The acceleration of gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. Some of you are like, I'm totally confused already. Just stick with me for a moment, okay? According to Newton's second law, the acceleration, A, of an object times its mass is equal to the external force acting on it. For this situation, Newton's law, second law gives M times A is equal to M times G, or A equals G. Thus, in a vacuum, all objects fall freely with the same constant acceleration, or G, regardless of their mass, okay? so. All that to say, you're probably thinking, I liked your first explanation better. <laughs> it's a little less wordy, a little less technical. But what I wanna point out about this is it's telling you some things you need to understand. One of the key ones here is looking at Newton's laws. They're telling you this can come up on your test. So you need to understand Newton's laws. There's some key words in here you need to know. Acceleration gravitational force, mass, where is it at? How all of those things interact together, okay? So there, if you are already a 240 tutoring user, we have all of this in our study guide. It will lay out Newton's laws, acceleration, all of those pieces for you. But if you are not a 240 tutoring user, these are terms and concepts you're going to have to get familiar with. And so what's nice about this answer explanation is it's pointing out to you things you need to know. You're not going to see this exact question on your exam. I wish you would because it's actually not too difficult, but you're not going to see this exact question. But they're showing you, you may see questions that contain this type of information, okay? So vacuum is another term you need to understand. What's really cool about the science is if you do look at the explanations, and even if you don't understand everything it says, if you can't wrap your brain around it, it's telling you the things you need to learn. What do you need to 
study. A common mistake we see teacher candidates make is they go through these practice questions and they learn the answers to those questions. So they study the question and the answer that goes with it. Well, like I just said, you're very, I mean, you're not, you're not gonna have these questions on your actual test. You might have variations of them or some that are similar, but you're not gonna have these exact questions. You're not gonna find the exact test questions in any preparation materials that you purchase either. So what this is pointing out to you are the things you need to study. And so that's why I put this answer explanation on here is so we could talk about that. All right, let's look at the next question. This is on physical properties of matter. It says which of the following laboratory instruments would be the most appropriate to use in determining the volume of a large block of wood of unknown density? So we don't know the uh, block of wood's density and we're trying to determine volume. That's what we're looking for, okay? And we're looking at a bunch of laboratory instruments and we'll talk about what each of those are in just a minute. So if you don't know, you can reason your way through that. But first thing you need to know is what is volume? Volume is the amount of matter or the amount of space something takes up, okay? So mass is the amount of matter in an object. Volume is the amount of space it takes up, okay? Now that's put in very simplistic terms. You can find a more technical definition, but this is what we teach to middle school students, junior high students. Volume is the amount of space an object takes up, all right? Now to find volume, we can do this a couple of ways. If we are looking at the volume of a liquid, we can simply put it in a graduated cylinder, I'm gonna abbreviate that just for time's sake, a flask, or any other measuring device. Okay, so even a measuring cup if we're working in metric or customary units, okay? But we can just put that liquid into something that measures, all right? Graduated cylinder, flask, or common ones. Uh, beakers will also have measuring sometimes on them. And so that's how you find the volume of a liquid. To find the volume of a rectangular prism, which it says a large block of wood. Block is telling you it's a rectangular prism. To find that, we simply do the formula, formula length times width times height. So we can find the volume if we know the measurement of the length, the width, and the height. So this is science crossing over with math. If you've seen our math videos, we did this in math, I believe, as well. So if we're doing this, in order to measure length, width, and height, what tool would we need? you would need a ruler, okay? So let's talk about what each of these are. Metric ruler, we know this is the answer. I'm gonna help you understand what these other ones are. A triple beam balance looks like um, it'll have like a plate on top and it's sitting on a stand and then it will have these bars that go across and there's usually three of them and you move those little bars until it, the little bars sit level, <laughs> okay? So that is a triple beam balance, triple beam, three beams, okay? And this is used to measure mass. So a mass is used to triple, uh, a triple beam balance is used to measure mass. A key word here is balance. All right, a balance is used to measure mass. Now, a flask could be used to measure volume of a liquid, all right? And a micrometer, if you don't know what a micrometer is, it's a gauge that measures small distances or thicknesses between two faces. Um, it's kind of this little gadget, it looks like calipers if you've ever seen those where you can move them away by turning a screw and it tightens on there. It's used for very small measurements, often used by engineers, okay? So you might can measure length, width, height with this, but it would be much more technical and not needed in this case. So the answer here is definitely A, a metric ruler to measure length, width, and height. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, why can't I drop a block 
in a glass that has measurements like that flask or a graduated cylinder or a beaker or something like that. And let me help you understand is so if I have that container and I drop that block in, there's space at the bottom around it that it's not filled up. So if you just read where the top of that block is on that container, then you are actually measuring the block in the air around it. Whereas when we pour a liquid in there, it fills up all that space. Okay. So if we wanted to find the volume and I'm teaching you this. So if you get a question, that's not a rectangular prism. All right. We wanted to find the volume of an irregular shaped object, right? Irregular shaped object. And so maybe I wanted to find the volume of, I'm just going to pick up something I have on this desk, the dry erase marker. Okay. I wanted to find the volume of this. I can't measure length, width, and height. It's got all different little shapes to it. You might could say I could do a cylinder and it's close, but look at the little top. It's, it won't work. And so what you can do is water displacement. So you fill a container with measuring marks on it, graduated cylinder, beaker, flask, something like that. Fill it with water. And then you drop the object in the water and you watch how much the water rises. The difference between where the water was originally and the new measurement is going to be the volume of the object you added. Okay, that's water displacement. So if you get asked a question about how do you find the volume of an irregular object, that's how you do it. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next question. So this one says a chlorine compound is added to swimming pools in order to. Now, hopefully, if you live anywhere in the South, you've probably been around a lot of swimming pools, maybe up North a few less, but hopefully through life experience, you can reason through this question by knowing that people put chlorine, there's the key word there, in their pool to basically sanitize it, clean it, keep it safe, all right? Even salt water pools often have chlorine tablets added for this very reason, to keep it clean, safe. With that said, D, because it says destroy bacteria, should be the most obvious answer. Should be, all right? But let's talk through each of these. Technically speaking, chlorine compounds are highly reactive oxidizing agents used to disinfect, okay? So let's talk about each of these other answer choices and why those wouldn't be correct. A says to monitor. Now to me, monitor means I'm looking at measurements or things like that. Chlorine is, it comes it can come in tablet form or liquid form, um, wouldn't be added to, or it can be dissolved into liquid form, um, wouldn't be added to monitor something. A chemical compound can't measure or monitor something, okay? So monitor should be a keyword that throws that out. If you're thrown off by pH, pH is a scale from one to 14 that measures the acidity or alkalinity of a liquid. So there's a pH scale that goes from zero, very acidic, to 14, all right? And then in the middle, the average would be around seven, okay? So that's pH. Chlorine compounding gonna do that. B, the word add should clue you in. Chlorine isn't gonna add color. Now, as the water gets disinfected, for lack of a better term, or treated by that chlorine compound, the color may change. If you've ever seen a really dirty pool, all right, and it gets goes from green to blue, you might get tricked by this one, okay? Because it doesn't add color to the water, all right? That may be a side effect or an effect of actually cleaning up the pool, but the chlorine compound itself does not do that, all right? C, soften the water by precipitating harmful chemicals. A chemical water softener is actually used for this, not chlorine. So, I mean, I can't say it any simpler, but you would use a water softener to soften the water, not chlorine, okay? So hopefully you can answer this one just based on some life experience, okay? Let's move on to the next question. This one's looking at energy. 
It says two campers each wrap a potato in aluminum foil prior to baking them in fire. However, one camper inserts a large nail into her potato after wrapping it in the foil. After the potatoes are placed on the fire, which of the following is most likely to happen? A, both potatoes will bake at the same rate. B, neither potato will bake because the foil will reflect most of the heat. C, the potato with the embedded nail will bake faster because heat will be conducted through the nail into the potato. D, the potato with the embedded nail will bake more slowly because heat will be conducted out of the potato through the nail. All right, so basically, this tests your knowledge of two things, conductors and insulators. Now, I'm pointing this out because these would be two terms you would need to be familiar with for your exam. So you need to know these two things, conductors and insulators. Now, we'll simply put, conductors allow energy in the form of heat or electricity to travel freely through them. All right, so if something conducts heat or electricity, it will pass right through it. This is why when something is cooking in a pot or pan on your stovetop, you don't grab the handle with your bare hand. Everybody knows this, why? Because the heat is passing right through that metal handle and it will go right to your hand and burn you, okay? So metals are conductors, all right? Insulators do not freely allow energy in the form of heat or electricity to travel freely through them, okay? So again, let's take that same scenario. You're gonna pick up a pot off the stove. You grab an, uh, you grab an oven mitt or a pot holder, that's the term, pot holder, to grab the handle of that. That pot holder or oven mitt is acting as an insulator. It does not allow the heat to pass through it to your hand, okay? So conductors versus insulators. It works the same for heat and electricity. So if this question were reworded to test your knowledge of conductors and insulators, it could be reworded with electricity, okay? So thinking about this, you have to know that foil, all right, would allow, it is a conductor, that heat to pass through it. If not, why would people wrap potatoes in foil and put them in the oven? All right, it would take forever for the potato to cook because the heat would not pass through that foil. So it is a conductor. Now what's funny is the nail, because it's a metal, is also a conductor and heat will pass through it as well. So what's cool about this, this question actually made me wanna try this when we make baked potatoes later this week with my family, is and we have to do it outside because I'm not gonna let my children experiment with that inside, but outside it would be really fun um, but you put that nail in there now instead of just the heat passing outside through that foil you've now got a nail going through the center of that potato and that heat's going to pass right through the center so now the potato is getting heated from the very center and all the outside where the foil is so all that heat's passing through so hence c would be the correct answer. The potato with the embedded nail would bake faster because heat would be conducted through the nail into the potato. So now you have it going right through the center of the potato and not just the outside. So conductors and insulators, things you need to know. All right, next question. We have two more. This one says, which of the following is a chemical element? This is one of those you just know or you don't. Now, hopefully you can narrow this down. First thing, so many terms you need to know today. What is a chemical element? Now, I'm gonna break this down for you. A chemical element, also just called an element, is any substance that cannot be decomposed into simpler substances by ordinary chemical processes. So elements are all the fundamental materials of which all matter is made, okay? They are found on the periodic table. Connect those two words in your mind, or sets of words. Elements, periodic table, those go together. Everything on the periodic table is an element. So some of you, it's starting to click already as soon as I said periodic table. So you're looking for which one of these would be on the periodic table as just itself, okay? So I'm gonna point this one out for you. The correct answer here, and you're either just gonna know or you're not. You might can narrow it down if you're unsure but it is platinum. 
Platinum is on the periodic table. Its atomic number is 78, and it's in the middle of the elements known as transition metals. So that's where you'll find it on the periodic table, um, right there in the middle where you see those transition metals. It has a bunch of neighbors around it, and those five metals together are called your platinum group metals. And so it actually, platinum names that whole little group of metals, okay? So this is your chemical element. Now, you may have known, hopefully you at least knew, water was H2O, all right? Hopefully you at least knew that. So water is actually comprised of two, or composed of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. So that's not it. Carbon dioxide is a combination of carbon and oxygen. And sodium chloride, otherwise known as salt, is a combination of sodium and chloride. And that's how you will find those on the periodic table, all right? But they are combinations of elements. They don't exist by themselves. Platinum is an element. It's all by itself. All right, number 78 on the atomic table or on the periodic table if you're looking for it, okay? So you at least need to be familiar with that. You don't have to memorize it. Um, if you had that high school chemistry teacher who made you memorize it, maybe some of it will come back to you. All right, last question for today. Of the following, which best describes an example of the Doppler effect? Now, hopefully, Something clicks when you hear Doppler, all right? I think of news, and the weatherman will say Doppler radar. And when I hear radar, I think of sound. I think of sound. We're looking at sound waves, okay? So that's how my brain reasoned through it. Otherwise, you just need to know, yeah, where did my pen go? That Doppler has to do with sound. If you at least know that, you can rule out A and B because A and B are talking about light and Doppler is talking about sound, okay? So let's talk about what the Doppler effect is. Now, the Doppler effect is when an observer or object approach the wavelength is shorter. So as those two things get closer together, the wavelength is shorter and the frequency and pitch are higher, okay? So let's pretend we had a person standing over here and we had a person standing over here and we had a car driving. <laughs> it's a really sad car, okay? We're driving, the car is really small compared to the person, but let's just go with it. As they get closer together, the wavelength between them, that wavelength in there, is going to be shorter, and thus the frequency and pitch are higher, okay? As they get further away, or as they move apart, the wavelength is longer, and the frequency and pitch are lower. So longer wavelength equals lower frequency and pitch. So if you can remember that, the longer wavelength is gonna be a lower frequency and pitch, then you can remember that the shorter would be higher. So as that sound gets closer, that object gets closer, car gets closer to the person, the frequency and pitch get louder because the wavelength is shorter. Whereas when it gets further away, it's going to get lower because that wavelength is longer. So the correct answer here is C. As an emergency vehicle approaches an observer standing by the road, the pitch of the siren increases. Whereas D, a sound wave hits a wall, it is reflected and creates an echo. That's not describing the Doppler effect, okay? So at least if you don't remember anything else, Doppler has to do with sound, and you can rule out half these answer choices, and that's super helpful, okay? So that's our last question for today. Of course, I'm gonna remind you, as I have on each of these videos, it is very important for you to know test format. 
you need to know about how many total questions are you going to get and how many approximately do you need to get correct. I get asked almost every week, well, how many do I have to get correct? It varies by state. So your state or agency determines that amount. If you have this question, if you're watching, if you want to know, drop a comment, even if you're watching this after the live has ended, put a comment in here and I'll come back and check it. And I'll give you a link to where you can see um, what the requirements are by state. You need to know style of questions and time limits. And then in science, all three topics are weighted equally. You also need to know what the screen and system looks like, and you can practice right here at this link I have listed here. If you just Google ETS practice or preparation materials, you can find, click your way through a few things to find it, but it'll actually give you practice with the on-screen system and what that looks like. Practice your pacing for all timed exams, and then know in your content-heavy subjects, so science, social studies, and some of your ELAR flashcards are going to be super helpful because there are things you're just going to have to know. Sometimes in math, if you can do some of the work, you can get it down to two answers and get a pretty good guess. But in science or social studies, if you don't know anything about that topic, you could be lost and just have you take a random guess from all the choices given. So flashcards to get yourself familiar with those topics. Again, you can look through the standards, all those topics and all those descriptive statements underneath it to find the things you need to know. It's also helpful to look through the answer explanations like I showed you on the first question we did today to help you see what else do I need to study under this topic. We have flashcards in 240 Tutoring. So if you're a 240 Tutoring subscriber, the flashcards are right there by topic in your science study guide. All right, that is all I have for you today. If you are interested in that study guide, you can go to 240tutoring.com slash study guides and check that out. If you'd like to check out our free resources, which includes a free diagnostic exam and other helpful materials, you can visit 240tutoring.com slash resources. Now, if you're like, I liked this video, this was helpful, or I want to see more, I didn't catch the whole video, they're all right here in our Praxis Study and Test Prep Facebook group. All right, so you can either scroll down through the feed or you can click on media videos and you can see all those videos. They are also on YouTube under a Praxis Study and Test Prep playlist. So you can go check it out on YouTube. We have all the videos for science. We finished that up today. And from a few weeks ago, we have the same thing for the math topics. And we work through all the questions that have been provided by ETS. So I hope you find this video helpful. And if you need anything else, I strongly encourage you to check out everything we have to offer on Facebook for 240 Tutoring. Lots of free resources and helpful materials there for you. I wish you all the best as you prepare for your exam. And again, I'm Dr. Christy Mulkey with 240 Tutoring. Thank you.